Uh, good morning again. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Hall, who cannot finally be with us today. And he's going to be doing his presentation online. Dr. Mark Hall is an award-winning commercial advertising photographer. His practice has spent three decades since graduating from Blackpool College in the mid 1980s. In that time, he has traveled extensively and been commissioned by many top advertising agencies, design groups, and editorial clients across the world. He began teaching in 2000 after completing an MA at the London College of Printing, and in 2018, successfully finished a PhD on the hegemony of light in photography. He is currently a fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts and a fellow of the British Institute of Photography. His work as a photographer has featured in the Association of Photographers, AOP, and Design and Art Direction Awards, and his students have also won numerous awards. He was voted AOP Lecturer of the Year for portrait work of big game hunters shot across Africa. His research interests include the technical language of photography that implied, uh, the implied structures of power inherent in the way light is used in photography and the critical theory of commercial photography. It's my pleasure to introduce to our colleague, Dr. Mark Hall. Dr. Mark Hall, it's your time. Hi, thank, uh, you. thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And um, I can only give my uh, sincerest apologies for uh, not being there in person. Um, um, I had a health issue which stopped me traveling, unfortunately. Um, so uh, that's why I'm not there. Otherwise, I would have been there. Um, the title of my paper today is um, A Ghost in the Machine, um, Remystification of the Photographic Image. And um, the conference poses the question, do the images we create digitally represent us and how might they control and transform us? I want to approach these questions and the special focus of this conference in a different way from the image, from within the image itself. We begin the question with an assumption of completion. The image uh, is a sense of uh, finality in this term, even though it is continually involving and, trans uh, and transforming object. We assume its fixity at the point of discussion. If we consider the image in an architectural sense, we might assume that, uh, that talking about a building in it, uh, is its physical structure, devoid of any adornment, set in a landscape that is that never changes and whose contents and purpose are similarly fixed at the point of completion. Now consider that same building centuries later, when its walls have crumbled through neglect and time and disregard has buried beneath the layers of civilization and progress, only to be unearthed and relocated within another age. It, re it remains reassessed and preserved uh, as a reflection of a bygone era. Such is the purpose of this paper, is to examine the archaeology of the image, to explore its physical and metaphysical strata, and to in introduce the potential for dialogue within these layers, for a sense of continuity within our, with our spiritual selves and the modernity in, that modernity and capitalism has devalued and, or commodified. At the same time, uh, I'm going to quote now from uh, Walter Benjamin um, uh, from a short history of photography. At the same time, photography uncovers in this material uh, physiognomic aspects of pictorial worlds, which live in the smallest things, perceptible yet covert enough to find shelter in daydreams, but which once enlarged and capable of formulation, show the difference between technology and magic to be entirely a matter of historical variables. The quote from A Short History of Photography by Walter Benjamin was written in 1931. 
a time at a time similar to the one we inhabit now uh, of instability and uncertainty where movements such as precisionism emerged alongside abstraction and surrealism in differing degrees of remove from the experience of everyday life. Benjamin explores the complex relationship we have with technology and the imagination that both fuels it and is stimulated by it. One might pose the question, are we growing tired of everything, of photographs of everything, of what we eat, see, do, love, look like, inside and out, have been, want to go, etc.? Or are we just so used to seeing images that we no longer notice them? Images have been used to demystify the world around us, to support and explain, and in doing so, they still retain the do they still retain the power they once had? The ubiquity of smartphones and social media platforms has turned photography into a populist activity. This shift might be seen as democratizing but also as leading to a superficial engagement with the world where the focus is on capturing images for social validation rather than genuine experience. One assumes that we live in an image saturated society, but for some the opposite is true. A visit to countries in the global south attest to the limited power images have within society in other parts of the world. There are many reasons for this. However, it is predominantly the, global, predominantly the global north I want to address in the scope of this discussion. What I want to draw your attention, uh, what do I want to draw to your attention? And it is a subject that's been discussed for some time now. Will there be a post photography era? And what would that look like? Photography is diminishing, diminishing in power by its ubiquity. The more images one sees, the less remarkable each one generally becomes. How then do those of us whose careers and livelihoods have rested on its inexorable rise in both importance and in value manage with its decline? One could not say that photographs or photography itself are declining when there are trillions of images taken each year. But the value of each individual image has surely declined. Walter Benjamin, in one of his landmark essays on photography, the, world, the work of art in, the age, in an age of mechanical reproduction, um, foresaw this and maintained that the connection with the image retained some physical relationship to, that, to the thing photographed and as such contained an aura a term that had evolved in spiritualist circles in the latter part of the 19th century to describe a subtle emanation from an object, a ghost-like presence. The so-called aura Benjamin described came as much from the desires of those looking at the image as it might from its materiality. Though it is the physical process, the methods used to control and create what we see that has often been the elephant in the room of photographic discourse. When we, uh, um, when uh, an illusionist uh, performs, they produce what might be described, might, what might, what we might describe as magic, by assembling a series of seemingly transparent processes to dispel any doubt that the audience, the audience might have of the viability of what they are witnessing. Whilst, whilst disbelief is suspended, something transformative occurs and what we see uh, and we see what we want to see and are delighted by the spectacle. Such is our relationship with the photographic image. As much as we know its inherent properties and underlying hegemony, still we want to believe what we want to see though and tr trust and our trust as viewers is often placed outside of the frame uh, is often placed outside of the frame uh, and in its context or in its provenance. In an era that some have called post-truth, images have been complicit in the constructions of belief, destabilizing and corrupting the image environment. If we can no longer look at, uh, no longer believe what we see and have distanced ourselves from the spiritual effect of religion, 
can we now look at an image and believe it's mistruth? Is there something that allows us the duality to believe and disbelieve? When Oxford philosopher Gilbert Ryle coined the phrase ghost in the machine in 1949, he did so as a critique of Cartesian dualism that saw a distinction made between mind and the between the mind and the body. A distinction suggestive of the relationship between the mind and its instrument, the camera. Um, reality may no longer be as desirable as it once was, and the constant stream of images and information that challenge even the most robust to maintain their sanity. Where where might we seek respite? Bruno Bettelheim, born in Vienna in 1903 and a Holocaust survivor, has suggested that the enchantment of fairy stories, such as those by Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm, help children grapple with the fears, um, with their fears in remote symbolic terms. Certainly there is plenty of evidence that escapism um, through this, through um, fairy stories is a common way to deal with difficulties of the present. C.S. Lewis once remarked, used in moderation, escapism could both serve to refresh and expand imaginative powers. Though escapism is only one avenue available and requires an alternative reality, one removed from the present. The way in which we engage with a photograph, with its materiality, holds the key to the way in which we reimagine its presence as object and portal. Lewis imagined a wardrobe as a portal to another world, one parallel to this one. The photographic image, its frame and multi-layered multi composition holds a key if we, to, we are to imagine its potential. Gilles Deleuze, whose theory of the fold um, is useful in understanding the complex relationship that the photographic a photograph has to its ontology and its recurrent materialization. Um, Deleuze con Deleuze's concept of the fold primarily is, is primarily derived from his interpretation of Baroque photographer, uh, sorry, Baroque philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, is an intricate philosophical metaphor that defies simple categorization. Deleuze uses the fold to explore the complexity and subjectivity uh, of subjectivity and identity, suggesting that the self whose proxy the image is not a stable unified entity, but is rather constituted by a process of continual folding and unfolding. This concept entirely extensively discussed in his work, The Fold, Leibniz and the Baroque, presents the fold as the dynamic process of internal difference where the inside and outside are not diametrically opposed, but are rather connected and interpenetrating. The inside of a photograph is an agglomeration of both past and present, where, the mom where a moment of light and dark is transcribed through different processes and at different times, each contingent on the trends of the time only to surface and resurface infinite times as a material presence or as a deep materialized moment. Um, I just want to stop to pause for a second and share my screen because I have some images to, to show you which illustrate uh, this point. Um, so I'm going to um, share my screen and um, uh, if I can do that, um, where are we? Okay, can you, um, uh, can you see my desktop? I'm sure. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can, yes, yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, we, we can see your images. Um, uh let's try okay hang on a second okay i need to i need I, i'm gonna have to rejoin the conference unfortunately because i've got to um okay so i'm gonna be able to record the cut okay no that's okay i've i've got it there um let's try it again 
Okay, so um, I think there we are. That's um, just trying to see which screen you can see now. Um, yeah, we can see your uh, word, your text. Okay, so you can see my text. Yes. Okay, so I've got two screens. That's all. That's okay. So, and yeah, that... um, is that better? Right. So, um, this is um, so what I'm looking at here is um, I've got uh, um, a couple of pictures to show you, which are from uh, Jacob Reese, and they are all um, photographs taken at, uh, well, they're all obviously the same photograph. And what I want to draw your attention to is the um, is the composition of the image and also what uh, what is... So Jacob Rees was a, a social reformer um, in, um, uh, in New York in the latter part of the 19th century. And he went into, um, into uh, those of you who are not familiar with his work, he was one of the first exponents of uh, Flash and used um, Flash in to uh, show tenements, um, often very dark places that uh, people inhabited, um, usually in the middle of the night, because that's the only time they were in them. And um, they were often, uh, often windowless. I mean, although you can see a window there, there was never any light on it through the windows. These places were often very dark. And in his book, um, How the Other Half Lives, he actually drew a picture of the um, the access to daylight that people had. So these were kind of warrens of, of small rooms that people rented for, for small periods of time just to sleep. What I want you to draw, draw your attention to is this. Can you see my cursor here on the screen? Um, I'm hoping you can. What you can see here is a squiggly line, okay? Now that squiggly line, for those of you who um, uh, do you need not perhaps um, do you need we, sorry do you need we see your mouse or something or what? Do no, you... I, I can. Can you actually see my? Can you see my cursor moving on the on the slide, or is it? Um, no. Is it? Um, okay. Well, in the foreground of the uh, of the image that you're looking at, um, which um, actually, I wonder if I can. Okay, I'm working with two screens is kind of a bit strange sometimes. Um, okay, so anyway, I um, show navigator. That's it. No. Okay, so I, I'm just going to keep talking because uh, otherwise I'll use up too much time. Um, so, in the foreground of the uh, the image you're looking at, you will see a squiggly white line. For those of you who aren't uh, perhaps technically minded, the um, what you're looking at here is two instant is something that's happened in the middle of the taking of this image. So the process that Im that um, that Reese would have done is that he would have uh, in he would have set up his camera he would have uh, in this was a time before uh, shutters were were um, were uh, in common use so he would have uncapped his lens but opened the uh, the um, put his plate in the back of the camera and then um, fired his um, uh, his flash which at that time was um, was a tray filled with magnesium powder. Um, and so he fired this gun, this uh, this this cap that uh, ignited the powder. So what you can see in the top right-hand corner is um, the light in that window is from his, uh, his flash. But during the exposure, when he's uncapped his, um, there would have been some level of illumination in the room prior to his exposure. And what's happened is somebody has got up with a cigarette or something, uh, a, a lit object, and got up and walked out of the picture. 
And that, that squiggle in the foreground is exactly that, somebody walking through the picture with some, some form of illumination, whether it be a pipe or a cigarette or something, um, and it's walked through the picture and then the, in, in the time prior to the image going, uh, the image taking place. So there's two temporal layers here, one, one at the point of, uh, of the flash going off and one prior to that where, where um, the time that uh, it took to walk through this picture, um, some density was being created. Um, I'm going to show you the three iterations of this picture. This is another one um, from the same archive. These are from, this is a Ludlow uh, Street Lodging Centre uh, cellar. These are all from the same archive, but these these are created at different times. So the, you notice the, the brownish tones of this first image. That is from the um, from the CPO used um, to uh, to um, stabilize the uh, the image surface. In this, it's less less uh, prominent, but still we see the um, the the same uh, the same photograph. But again, there is slightly different tonal tonal values in the foreground and in the background. And finally. Um, also from the same archive is another picture again with which is much brighter um, you can see more detail underneath the bed and in the windows on the uh, just above the center of the image but now what you can see is that somebody has made an attempt to um, mechanically um, retouch the um, the the uh, the image to get rid of the the line across the center you may not be able to see it um on your screen i'm hoping you can but um but it is there the um what somebody has done is to actually just uh physically um dab ink or um or uh quite often it would have been uh, pencil onto that line to build up density so that it didn't show through as white on the uh, on the negative. So I'm just gonna stop that now. I've got another couple of pictures. I might show you, um, which I'll show you later on. So I'm gonna stop sharing my, um, my, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my, my thing. Okay, so I, I've illustrated some some elements of the of the composition of an early early image. So um, for Deleuze, the fold signifies a way in which reality and experience are never fully separable into discrete elements, but are instead instead characterized by fluid and overlapping structures. The fold therefore becomes a metaphor for how images are perceived and interact with the world endlessly creating new dimensions of our own subjectivity, akin to an infinite piece of fabric that is perpetually folding uh, onto itself, creating patterns, textures, and forms in a continuous movement without, clear, without a clear beginning or end. As we saw in that image, we were looking at um, a, a range of different um, interactions or uh, interventions in that image journey from the original concept and the original photograph well which would have been um, shown as a lantern slide um, in a public lecture to subsequent iterations as a as a print the camera itself um, going back to uh, to Deleuze and Leibniz uh, the camera itself acts like a monad in Leibniz's philosophy a singular point of perception with no windows, meaning they reflect the world without directly interacting with it. In a similar way, the camera, re camera records light reflected from an object without directly interacting with it, encapsulating a sim single, singular perspective of that moment. The photograph, therefore, like a monad, represents a unique perspective that reflects the complexity of its subject from the surface. Vladimir Nabokov wrote of this surface in Transparent Things. 
um, a novel from 1972, and suggested that our desires for revisiting the past, as all photographs are part of the past, is grounded in a present that is contingent with the past through the image. And I'm going to quote from the uh, from um, uh, from Navikov now from his novel um, Transparent Things. Perhaps if the future existed concretely and individually as something that could be discerned by a better brain, the past would not be so seductive. Its demands would be balanced by those of the future. Persons might then straddle the middle stretch of the seesaw when considering this or that object. But the future has no such reality as, as the pictured past and the perceived present possess. The future is but a figure of speech, a spectre of thought. For Nabokov, the surface has a tension created by the present that is a thin veneer of, uh, and I'm quoting from, uh, from uh, Nabokov now. Um, uh, for Nabokov, the surface has a tension created by the present that is a thin veneer of immediate reality spread over natural and artificial matter and whose wishes to remain in the now, with the now and on the now should please not to break its tension film. So we're talking about the, the kind of surface tension of, of the, uh, the image. Surfaces also occur in photographs as a metaphor for the exteriority of a subject. Um, though as Stephen Shaw wrote in his series, American Surfaces, it has at this point become a motile and fluid architecture for photographic meaning. Simultaneously conceptualist, documentary, formalist, art historical, and paradoxically for a photographic series, atemporal. Not only can surfaces be rendered as subject and object, but as the exterior of an architecture of meaning with the potential for, for the hidden to become a catalyst for a more spiritual engagement with the interior of an image. I'm going to, again, I'm going to swap back to uh, showing you, um, uh, sharing my screen again. And apologies for the kind of disruptive nature of this. And I hope you'll, you'll follow me here. Um, Um, let's share that. Okay, so hopefully you can see now. You can see um, to in the in the composition in the way that um, that um, Stephen Shaw worked in the in the way he created um, his. Uh, early work in 1972 of um, called American Services. <laughs> Excuse me. He began with the photograph with the uh, camera on the left, which is a, is called a Mica Mac. Um, it's a very cheap children's camera with a with a screw with a um, with a small flash bulb on the top. So the flash would go off um, whenever the uh, whenever the, the camera determined that there was not enough light. He then, um, after going through um, the uh, process of, um, of producing the earlier images, he changed to the camera on the right-hand side, which is a Raleigh 35S. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is because it's, it's um, the way in which the Raleigh shows the, uh, the images, and I'll show you in the next, in the next slide. Or the next two slides, the differences between them. Um, and a quote from, from Stephen Shaw from that period, as he, as he looked back over his work, he said, I discovered early on that the kind of camera I used affected the images I got. First of all, he, he was talk, would talk about the, uh, the Micamac because everybody who saw that would smile in his photographs. But more increasingly, the, the quality of the, the, the Raleigh 35S um, was, was quite significant, quite important to him. So if we look at the next photograph, I want you to draw your attention to the, um, the bottom picture of the two. The top is just what the camera looks like from the front. The bottom picture is the bottom plate of the camera. 
Now, the, I'm showing you that because it's it's quite unique. Because what you see on the, those of you who are not familiar with the construction of a camera, what you'll see on the right-hand side is a, is a square with a, uh, a dot in the center of it. That is what we term as a hot shoe. And a hot shoe is means that it's directly related to the um, the shutter, in that um, that when you when the setting is is set to flash, it will automatically electronically trigger the flash, which means that the camera and the photographer has more direct control over the the um, the flash itself. Now, if we have a look at the two pictures that follow this, one is that um, one is taken in September to October although it's a later print. But what you're looking at here is, um, is the interior of a, of a taxi. But you want to draw your attention to the fact that the flash is in the center of the picture, meaning that it's very close to the, the lens axis. Um, now that is quite common for, uh, for, but for uh, cameras where there is a, a fixed flash on top of the thing or on top of the camera or something that's very close to the lens axis something which often uh causes um red eye now look at the next picture look at the shadows on this this uh this picture here we're looking at um the shadows are at the, t at the top of the image meaning that the cap that the flash in this this instance has been mounted on the bottom of the camera. Now people, and in in this particular in instance, and there are many others, uh, if you look at the work of Diane Arbus, for instance, Diane Arbus had a, ten had a tendency to mount the flash on the bottom or invert the flash um, because she used a, a, a twin lens reflex often. Um, she would invert the flash, which was um, like a, um, uh, a circle on top of a on top of a column, and um, she would invert it so that the flash was effectively going upwards through the picture rather than down, which is something that that adds a, an element, a very subtle element of strangeness, because we assume light to come from the top, and our eyes are designed in that that kind of way, but that adds a, a, a subtle layer of of difference to um, to the image. Okay, so I'm going to just stop sharing now. Um, okay, and I'm going to go back to... Um, so, as Nabokov suggests, if we sink beneath the surface of an image, we're met with the te technical archaeology of the ages since its creation. The passage of light or the memory of it lingers in each fold of its construction. Thousands of choices, decisions, priorities, and trends are here. The once fashionable techniques that stunned innocent audiences are here and are reimagined for another demanding audience. The tonal register that was expanded by the sheer volume of silver in its coating in early photographs, um, uh, so dense that one can see it shining on the surface of some 19th century prints, was contracted when the cost of it, uh, when the cost became an issue for the, for the ever expanding and democratized market. More recently, now that silver and its various surrogates have been removed and replaced with digital camera chips, known as image sensors, that are made up of millions of photosensitive diodes called pixels. Um, there are two main types of image sensors in digital cameras, CCD, um, charge couple device and CMOS, uh, uh, complementary metal oxide semiconductors, which are made up of photosensitive areas. This is where the light is captured. Color filters, digital sensors, typically have a Bayer filter mosaic comprising red, green, and blue filters over the pixels to capture color information. This arrangement usually follows a pat pattern with twice as many green filters as red or blue to mimic the human eye's greater sensitivity to green light. Micro lenses, each pixel may have a micro lens on top of it to focus the incoming light into, into the photosensitive area to increase the amount of light captured and improve the efficiency of the sensor. 
photodiodes. These these convert light into an electrical electrical charge. AC AD converters, analog to digital converters, are used to convert the electrical charge into a digital value. Substrata. Uh, this is a base material uh, material usually of silicon. Which it, on which the sensor is built, and an anti-aliasing anti filter, or no, also known as a low-pass filter that's placed in front of the sensor to reduce moray. So what we're seeing here is that, is that the, each image is made up of, of, um, of many different layers. Each of them has different um, purposes. And it was exactly the same in, in film and analog. The layers of film were um, either color film or black and white film was made up of different layers in terms of um, uh, and the passage of light through each layer was was um, uh, affected each layer in a different way. So each of these developments prioritizes one thing over another in the search for perfection, clarity, fidelity or tonal range. If they didn't, all cameras would be the same size, produce images of the same quality. It is not really the interest to the viewer that these decisions are made. However, they do affect the outcome, as Stephen Shaw uh, iterates, uh, mentioned earlier. One might extend this uh, to suggest that they affect the outcomes as each rendition of an image is a temporal accordion of such choices and decisions. Returning to the Baroque fascination with folds and infinite layers, um, they suggest can be related to the depths and layers in a photograph. Just as a fold can hide and reveal parts of, of itself, so too can a photograph present layers of detail and meaning that may be revealed upon closer examination and through the context in which it is viewed. The most fascinating in is the interplay of light and dark in Baroque art and where there is a significant emphasis on the contrast and relationship between light and shadow, much like the photographic process, which relies on capturing various intensities of light. The dynamics of illu illumination and obscurity in a photograph can be considered a visual echo of Baroque aesthetic principles, though postmodern aesthetic principles tend to recoil, recoil from such evidently coerce, coercive and hierarchical use of light, preferring evenness that implies a lack of preference. Still within these, these even surfaces where subjects appear to speak for themselves, there, are always some, there is always something excluded or hidden within either the image or its composition. The fold introduces the concept of continuous development and transformation that resists finality. The fold signifies a process of constant becoming, a field of imminence where the inside is nothing more than a fold of the outside. Deleuze's notion can be applied to the photographic process where the act of taking a photograph is like creating a fold in time and space, a moment captured, a segment differentiated from the continuum yet still part of the whole. Deleuze's fold con conceptualizes a fluid continuity between the inside and the outside where boundaries are permeable and everything is in a state of becoming. The photographic process involves folding a moment of reality and capturing it on film or a digital sensor as we've seen. This moment is a fold in time that now exists as a photograph a still image that, con that continues to interact with the world. Light in photography has traditionally been the medium that inscribes reality into a two-dimensional surface, creating an image that is both a reflection and reconstruction of the world, a folded version of reality. It captures the light and shadow, depth and surface, an interplay between the visible and invisible, echoing Deleuze's notion that the world is full of folds and, and unfoldings. The image becomes a space where the exteriority of the photograph subject is folded into the interiority of the photograph itself. The three-dimensional moment folds into a two-dimensional image, creating a complex interplay of reality and representation. The process of developing a photograph from, negative, from a negative can be seen as a literally un a literal unfolding where the latent image 
becomes a visible uh, becomes visible a process of unfolding from the virtual to the concrete and the same the, the same would be true of the um of the digital image which has to be um once it's uh, becomes a um um an electronic impulse and is translated into uh into um uh, a digital file needs translation through various different um various different programs Walter Benjamin notes the loss of aura in the age of mechanical and now digital reproduction. He also acknowledges the potential for new mass engaged rituals to emerge, such as we have seen emerge from social media platforms, such as Instagram through likes and followers, new terms to express some connection with one person's view of their world, thereby democratizing each image through multiple encounters. Each engagement can be seen as a re-enchantment, a rediscovery of the image's surface and a new fold in the viewer's experience. French philosopher Bernard Stiegler um, is critical of the standardization and homogenization that often accompanies industrial processes. In photography, this can relate to the dominance of cer certain aesthetics or the prevalence of photo editing software that push images to conform to specific norms. Creative and experimental photography that breaks away from these norms can be seen as a form of resistance that aligns with Stiegler's call for the preservation of individuality and cultural diversity. The photography in this context is in uh, as a technological medium, reinterprets and represents the world around us. It can alter our perception of reality, sometimes enhancing our understanding of it other times uh, oversimplifying or distorting it. Stiegler has emphasized the importance of aesthetic education in countering the negative impacts of industrialization on culture. Photography, when approached as an art form and a craft, can be a means of re-enchantment, uh, encouraging a more, more profound engagement with the world and fostering a sense of wonder and appreciation for the visual environment. So Deleuze's concept of the fold can be juxtaposed with Benjamin's idea of the aura in the sense that each reproduction of the artwork is a refolding of the original aura, thus altering its form and substance. Every time a work is reproduced, it folds the original aura into the new context, potentially creating a new kind of enchantment or meaning, as we saw with um, the reinterpretation and reprinting of different forms of um, of uh, Jacob Rees's work. Um, uh, so Benjamin's exploration of the arc in the, uh, uh, sorry, of art in the wake of mechanical reproduction can be seen as a kind of fold where the original work's aura, its unique presence in time and space is folded into its reproductions, transforming me both meaning of the original and the nature of copies a form of, that characterizes an infinite process of change, continuity, and transformation, as we saw with uh, Stiegler's interest in digital culture sounds a note of caution. If one examines the implication of the photographic process in the era of big data, photographs are now data points that can be analyzed, manipulated, and monetized, raising questions about surveillance, privacy, and the commodification of personal experience. If the folding image represents continual change and the aura, its uniqueness and specificity, how might we then re-enchant the image? Benjamin's concept of the aura could be interpreted as a plea for re-enchantment in a world where the sacredness of the art object is undermined by its technical reproducibility. Yet, through the very process of mechanical reproduction, a different kind of enchantment or aura might emerge one that celebrates the different processes, reveals the various fingerprints of makers and societies that yield each iteration and have been folded into the strata of each image and only partially revealed through its archaeology. Reenchantment through this process reminds viewers of the strangeness and beauty of the unremarkable, not just of the here and now, but of each encounter with the everyday the light, what it meant then and what it means now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. 
thank you very much, um, Professor Hall. I don't know how long I was, but uh, I seem to be talking forever. <laughs> Hello. So apologies if I've, if I've gone over time. Don't worry, we are, we're in time. It's uh, 15 minutes past 11. Uh, so we have some minutes so for the audience to ask uh, you uh, a question. Okay, we have one question. Um, hello, my name is Andrea Schelske from Germany. And, uh, hi, Andrea. Hi. And Benjamin uh, wrote the book, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Uh, I thought mm -hmm. translations for me, technical reproduction, but uh, now I think the new title, it's The Work of Art in the Age of Computational Reproduction. And my question is, uh, is artificial intelligence the end of the photography? Uh, because the technical reproduction of an image is now being taken over by the artificial intelligence. And I think, what is now a photography? That's my question. Can we speak about photography? But I think the uh, age of the photography, it's now over. And um, also in thinking of Benjamin, and uh, which kind of reality is it now if the photography is in construction of reality? And in the age of photography and the age of an hour, I think it's now over. Uh, I can't... Um, I expect um, yes, I, we have the next one, two years, or maybe 10 years, but uh, I think, um, what's the special idea of a photography? I, I'd, um, I'd agree with, um, I'd agree with you. Uh, and, and certainly, um, as an educator, um, it's something that, uh, that um, students and myself are only too aware of. And as you rightly say, that um, that that uh, the new era of AI brings a whole new level, but <clears throat> but um, the um, the I mean I can only speak for I think the the thing is with um, with uh, if we're moving towards a uh, um, uh, an environment where where um, it's created entirely by um, by uh, this kind of um, uh, perfection or search for perfection. I think what I've what I've seen um, is that um, certainly in in some areas of photography, and you'll be aware of this uh, as well, is that um, is that people are re-examining um, a lot more analog processes. They're re-examining. They're going back over. We're looking at uh, different elements of sustainability. People are uh, processing film in in various different ways in different um, different chemicals. Um, so I think, I mean, I I I, I do sound, I do understand your kind of note of caution, and I think that um, that there are some areas of of society that would see photography as a as um, as over, but I don't I don't see uh, I mean, I've um, my journey in photography has been it's, it started in an analog era, and I remember the same discussions happening around the same around the time when digital and um, Photoshop um, started to uh, started to make their effect. But what I what I see more than anything is that um, is that photography becomes an expanded medium, that it never it was never one thing, and that although um, AI has the capacity to replicate. Um, there is still uh, there is still a sense that um, that um, that of authenticity that um, that is lacking in in something that is mechanically or electrically reproduced or um, reproduced by um, by algorithms. But it's all the the thing is as well that it also becomes a compendium of of references to um, a bygone era. So the the AI at the moment isn't creating anything new. What it creates is something new that looks like something that already existed. So therefore, therefore, it, it's it's a um, it's a different version, I think, of of something rather than rather than a um a way to uh distance ourselves from um from something that's um that is part of this continual process of evol evolution 
Thank you. Well, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, we have two more, and uh, that's we we keep that all that's final two questions because we have to we have the the uh, coffee break now. Okay, at at half. I've got to have coffee. <laughs> yes. So I we <laughs> send you a coffee, okay, <laughs> through algorithm. Thank you. Yes. Intelligent artificial artificial intelligence or something. Okay, the next question. Um, hi, I'm Hannah Wilder. First of all, thank you so much for your talk. I really appreciated it. Um, I'm wondering. Thank you, Hannah. I'm wondering because you discuss aura so much, but also aura as we're entering um, a new era, if you bring in anything from the pictures generation into your work um, and kind of this study of replication that feels. Um, almost somewhat effortless. Um, yeah, do I bring it into my work? Or like into it's, the research you're doing? On this I topic. mean, it's, it's, um, it's something that, um, that's at the moment, I mean, it's, it's something that's changing quite, uh, quite quickly. I mean, I, I was at a conference, um, uh, just a few months ago with um, a, top, a global advertising agency to discuss exactly this uh, topic. And they were, they were concerned about um, a range of different things, not just from the, the kind of the, um, the way that generative AI was, was producing images, but it was learning from a flawed perspective. It was learning from something that, that, We'd moved. We'd moved to a to a point positioning where um, where um, we'd begun a, the process of um, of ironing out some of the uh, some of the earlier issues with uh, representation. Um, that now we were plumbing the depths of um, going back over the things without context and and reimagining them, and. Um, it was quite interesting to to do that to, to do a um, a uh, some tests as we did part of that, as part of that conference and um, it threw up some really interesting um, interesting um, um, uh, interesting um, thoughts. But um, coming back to your point, one of my one of my uh, former students is a um, is a commercial photographer and um i had a discussion with her in the summer about um about ai and suggested that she um start to integrate it into her practice what she's managed to do is she uses it very much for um for um to pr to provide clients um to visualize what her final images will look like but um, the the issue that that most people have with um, with uh, AI is the lack of copyright. Anything that's generated by a machine is very difficult to um, to copyright. And therefore, if you are a creator, if you even if you create um, even if you create AI images as 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 many people do, um, once they become uh, once they're published, once they become common common usage they 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 just um well you don't own them um so i think that that what what happens when you get um such a speedy um transition to the new is that people start to consider reconsider the old and i don't mean old in terms of old images but the 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 way we we connect with images in general and what I what I've been looking at and what I've what I've been discussing is is, and I believe firmly believe that um, that there is that in this kind of in this um, and you know I didn't get a chance to kind of expand on the the points but um, in this um, if you look at Weber's talk about um, uh, disenchantment. Um, We've become disenchanted with so many things in modern society, um, in, in 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 infrastructures um, of uh, that we previously um, relied very heavily on. So that moves us back into a, a sense of of um, of the individual 
and coming back to your point about the aura i think the we we're drawn back to that sense of um of the individual the unique and we look in the the value of photographs for instance um in the art market just to take up that point is that um the the closer they are the the more value they become more valuable the closer they are to the uh, original um the the original uh, ontology so when they were first taken so a photo photographer like david bailey for instance um if he produce if he himself produces a print close to the time when the print when the photograph was taken that is more valuable than the subsequent reproductions even by himself um or by others of the same negative so there is there is a value there's a cultural value in in um in that uh, provenance and the uh, the aura if you like um of originality and i think however quickly we move i think that the the issue with ai in particular i think is that um is that it's 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 been made into something that it isn't um, although it's uh, it's capable of doing lots of things, it's um, it's very it's very difficult to replicate anything. So you can everything's made. If, if any of you who who's worked with AI will know that um, it, you know if you're using something like uh, Mid Journey, for instance, you produce um, you produce an iteration of something, and then the next time you ask it, it produces something else. So the control of the medium is a lot more difficult, a lot more time consuming than than perhaps it's it appears, and it so it's very good at at um, at replicating um, uh, things that um, are automatic processes, but where the individual and the the maker and the individual creative brain interact with that uh, with that image, then that's that still retains its value and certainly my my uh the my um former student has found that that she 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 sold the client on um on a series of pictures but then was was caught um to a point where she had to replicate the images that she'd created um although she she the way she made them was the fact that she understood her own processes to a point to a level that the the um, the AI could then replicate versions of her. So where she would to, to have taken those pictures, because she put in the lens choices, the angles, and everything else, it then oh, yeah. um, came back with versions. Sorry, sorry, you again. Yeah, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Um, is great. No, you have to interrupt, happens. otherwise I'll talk forever. Yeah, uh, we <laughs> have uh, only two minutes for quick question and quick answer, if you mind. Um, yeah. Okay, let's give this a try. Thank you very much for your great talk. Um, I want to build off the questions, but turning to Deleuze. So um, mm -hmm. his uh, take on photography is very much in line with his later work on cinema, you know, from movement image to time image. Uh, I'm going to yes. be quick. So um, Lev Manovich has kind of problem uh, has you know talked about how in the age of the digital, the uh, image mm -hmm. basically becomes or has the option of becoming pure construction, meaning uh, the ontological relationship with reality has changed. And my question is, do you think that uh, because, um, you know, it's no longer necessarily a reflection or representation of any reality, an unfolding of that reality, do you think that Deleuze's model, uh, his model has reached its limits when we are talking about digital images? Okay, that is a great question. It's not fast <laughs> Not to ask. Is, is to it, answer. Okay. Should I say should, yes? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's it's a, it is a great question, and it would be lovely to uh, to expand on that. But um, I don't think that um, Deleuze's uh, not for me anyway. I I don't think that Deleuze's um, thinking in relation to uh, the fold um, becomes redundant at that point because 
even whatever um when you've got uh, replications of of reality um they're still referencing some elements of so they're a compendium of, of, of like a greatest hits album if you like so even though they're not one thing they've become a, a greatest hits of all the all the best the best bits of of that particular picture so everything is perfect um but not not whole um i hope that answers your question in a, in a very quick way Great. I'm just uh, aware Thank of your coffee getting cold. Yeah, uh, we, of course. Uh, it's a real pity that, that you are not here, but you can continue the discussion yeah. over the uh, online platform. Uh, of course, if yes, if you, if any of you want to email me um, and okay. to to pick this up a, a bit later, then um, then the uh, the organizers um, um, give permission for the organizers oh. to share my email out. And, and, to, um, and contact details and I'm, I'm quite happy to I'd love to to be in touch with you and I'm really sorry that I'm not not there we are going to make my own coffee this is fantastic uh, and it's freezing here it's freezing uh, and wet what's, and, what's and raining outside of course you know so judging by the judges I can't see any umbrellas and and um and thick coats so I'm imagining it it's nice and sunny like it always is in Spain certainly when uh, I've ever been there uh, we are have now a, a co coffee slash discussion on your specific theme. I'm pretty sure. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Professor. I uh, hope to see you next time here in the flesh. Yes, so definitely. Thank you and bye bye. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so it's coffee break. We can discuss uh, Walter, Benjamin, Didi, Haberman, whatever you philosopher of David want, or just talk about, uh, you know, other things.